Let's move on to our next speaker, and that will be Dr. Carl Dolan. He's our extension beef specialist, nutritionist, and reproductive physiologist here on campus in our animal science department. And uh, we've asked him to talk a little bit about pregnancy detect detection in cows. So with that, uh, Carl, if you'd like to uh, share with us um, so we can be done in a timely fashion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. One last talk. Yeah. Good luck with the... Uh, keeping on time thing. But it's nice because now uh, everybody that was in the room has cleared out of the room. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about methods of pregnancy detection. That was kind of the charge. And I'll give you the very abbreviated version. If you guys have got any questions, um, just feel free to ask. But when I talk about methods of pregnancy detection, the first thing that comes to mind was, well, what's going on out there in our industry currently? And I don't know how many times I've shown slides like this, where I come in and talk about a NOM survey that shows that less than 20% of our producers out there are using palpation for pregnancy detection. And reasons for and against that, you know, this is an individual operation uh, decision, but this is the basis that we are starting with. So four methods that I'm going to talk about um, the first is going to be an old standby. I'm going to go out and bump that calf. Um, then the most common will be a palpation per rectum and getting into um, you know, some modernized transrectal ultrasonography. And um, one that's come about uh, more recently is uh, evaluation of blood samples for some pregnancy-specific proteins. And, and the question ultimately is which one is right for you? So my goal at the end of the day is to, to have a discussion about what is it that you need to consider when looking at these different methods. So this is the old bumping the calf routine. And I don't know how many of you have done this. Um, normally, if I have an audience and I'm not talking to a wall, I would have a show of hands for something like this. But here we got our old uh, baldy beef cow. You make a fist put it up against your flank there, give it a good push. What you feel is that calf, as it's kind of coming back from that push, hitting up against your hand. Now, this is kind of a remnant throwback from a lot of dairy work that's been done. If you've got a nice, calm beef cow, you might be able to try it with her. Um, but the third step to this whole technique is hope that her kick doesn't connect with you because most likely our beef cows, this isn't a real practical method. Uh, works great if you've got nice, calm cows. Calves have got to be pretty big. There's got to be something there for her to, you know, to, to come back and hit your hand on. So this is a late gestation thing. Is that cow out there pregnant? She hasn't calved yet. She hasn't started to bag up yet. Everybody else has dropped a calf. This one might be an option for you. Uh, if you do, good luck. All right. Palpation per rectum. The concept of most of the palpation per, per rectum is what we call a fetal membrane slip. And we talk about fetal membrane. Most of you guys, what you see out there is Doc's got his arm up a cow's butt and not quite sure what he's doing, but he's really green if it's a good summer day. Um, when we've got calves that are in utero, we've got a calf here and there's three layers of placenta. All right, we've got the first layer goes right around the calf here. This is the amnion. And then we've got two layers out here, chorion and allantois. When we talk about a fetal membrane slip, what we're doing is we're in there and we're actually squeezing the uterus around the edges of this placenta. And as we squeeze them together, this membrane slips away from these membranes. That's what we mean, fetal membrane slip. So that's what Doc's doing when he's in there messing around. Other things that we look for during palpation per rectum. A fetal membrane slip is the first thing that we can feel in there. As we progress into pregnancy, around 90 days, we can feel what we call placentomes. Now, placentomes are basically placental attachments. It's the whole big structure in there on the dam side, on the, the mother side, we have caruncles. The way I remember this is mom drives a car. 
on the calf side of the placenta, we have cotyledons. Okay, so baby sleeps in a cot. Together, these form the placentomes. We can feel them, ball-like structures on there. This is a placenta, just got dropped out into a pasture right here. We've got one of these balls here, one of these balls. Think, okay, we're dealing with a calf placenta, so these are cotyledons. If you're so unfortunate to have a uterine prolapse out there, that's the time when we really get to see this other side, and it's never pretty. All right, another thing that we can feel, uh, again, as we progress through pregnancy, calves get big and we may not be able to physically reach them. But this one right here, Phromitis, this is basically a whole bunch of blood pulsing through a uterine artery. Uh, early on, when we don't have a pregnancy, we've got about 3.5 millimeters. So if you think about it, that's maybe about the size of a, a, a thin, thin pencil. That's how big that uterine artery is inside that animal. Now, that increases to about 1.5 centimeters. So if I think in centimeters, now we've got well over three quarters of an inch, about the size of a thumb. Uh, so that's a tremendous increase in size. And what we can do is just reach in and feel the blood vibrating through there. Um, and, and that's all we'll say about that. The other thing that we can feel is just the calf. We can physically feel the calf. And so as we progress through pregnancy, we say, okay, a two-month-old pregnancy, about the size of a mouse. And then as we go up, we've got rat, small cat, large cat. And about six months, he's like a beagle. I'd say kind of a full-grown beagle. I'm not sure if that's a 10-inch beagle or a 12-inch beagle, but it's a beagle. Um, this is by far the most common method, the palpation per rectum as a whole. Uh, if you're really, really good, and again, I've got much, much, much experience out here. Um, heifers, you might be able to get around 30 days. Cows, around 35 days. Now, this is right on the border. Uh, most people, um, most veterinarians are comfortable with this 45 to 60 days of gestation, of calling pregnancies at that point in time. This is a veterinarian specific measure of what they are comfortable doing. So have that conversation with your veterinarian about where, um, what stage of pregnancy they can physically palpate. Uh, the nice thing about palpation per rectum is I get an answer right now. Cow's there, in the chute, if she's open, I can put her right on a truck. No questions asked, so immediate answer. Okay, this uh, next one I'm gonna talk about is ultrasound and I've given classroom lectures on ultrasound and talked for about three hours at a crack on this, so I'm going to try to keep it short. Uh, here I've got one of my graduate students, uh, Sharnay Klein, from out in the Beulah area. She is learning how to ultrasound, and there's a pretty good learning curve associated with this. Uh, but the principle of ultrasound, you've got a box here, and that box produces electricity. You've got all kinds of little wires in this probe or this transducer. And at the end of that transducer, we've got a whole bunch of little crystals. Uh, this goes back to some physics classes and things like that that uh, you may have heard. Energy is neither gained nor lost. So what happens when that electricity hits the crystals, they make a small change in shape. Okay, that change in shape of the crystals causes two things. One, it causes a small amount of heat, and two, it causes a sound or a noise. This noise is at a level, a frequency that we can't hear. Okay, that's why we call it ultrasound. It's a sound, it's there, but we can't hear it. It may drive your dogs crazy, but we're not going to be impacted by it at all. So, what we see on the ultrasound screen is actually those sound waves as they're bouncing back up into the probe and being interpreted by the machine. So a black color means fluid or that the, the waves did not get bounced back up into that uh, probe. A white color means that, yeah, the sound waves bounce right back up. So this is what we see with a 25 day pregnancy. Here is a fetus, very, very small, 
and we've got a little bit of fluid surrounding the fetus. Fluid around a fetus is kind of the hallmark that um, I start a lot of people looking for because it's the easiest thing to pick up. As we progress, this is a 35-day pregnancy, uh, and on your far right, we've got a 50-day pregnancy. Again, we've got a, a nose, a muzzle here, a head. We can see the spine of the animal, umbilical cord, some back legs. So I get a question all the time about, you know, can you age a fetus? And yeah, we can age a fetus. We can do this with um, palpation. We talked about the cat, rat, dog, that whole concept of different sizes of fetus. Uh, with ultrasound, what we can do is we can, we can do pretty soon after um, conception, we can start to get a real accurate age on these fetuses. And this picture shows a concept of fetal growth and what happens. So along the bottom here, we've got the size of the fetus. And along the side here, we've got a stage of gestation. So this middle line is, we're going to call it a normal calf. Then on the, this line on the right, we're going to call it a fast-growing calf. And a line on the left is a slow-growing calf. Now, if you look at the differences here, early on in gestation, we've got pretty similar growth among fetuses. The further we get out into gestation, the more variation in fetal size there happens to be. So where I'm going with that is you, if you want to get a real good age on a fetus, do it as soon as possible after conception. That's going to be your most accurate age. As we proceed later, if you're just trying to get a good fetal age and these calves may be six months old already, very, very difficult to do with ultrasound. All right, we've also got all kinds of different parts of an animal, and we know kind of at what stage um, these different things start to happen. So around 20 to 21 days, we can first see an embryo with ultrasound. And a lot of this is basically from a heartbeat because we've got some type of movement, some little flicker going on in there. And then we've got all the other things that develop. So if we want to get really picky, we can say, okay, well, this calf is, he's there. I can see an eye orbit but I can't see any split hooves. So that right there tells me he's between 30 and 45 days old. Um, that's one way to do it. I'm trying to figure out what I've got here. All right, a 30-day pregnancy uterine width. That just kind of looks at the, the measurement of the uterus here. Uh, this is a 100-day pregnancy in the middle. Again, what we're looking at here is a hind foot. So this is bone in the leg. We've got dew claws right here and we've got each of the hooves at this point. So that's a hind limb on a 100-day pregnancy. Over here, um, we've got a 43-day pregnancy, and what I'm looking at there is called the crown rump length. So it's top of the head to the bottom of the butt. Okay, that's what I'm looking at here. Now, you'll see on the right hand, bottom right-hand corner, it's that ultrasound can be used effectively until 120 days of gestation. Uh, there really shouldn't be a number here. It's more of a concept that ultrasound works until you can't reach the calf anymore. As a calf grows up, at a certain point in time, it may just tip right over the pelvic rim, and um, God was very kind to me. He gave me very long, skinny arms, so I can stick them way inside a cow, but there's an awful lot of cows that I can't physically reach the calf on. So age determination, these kind of things with ultrasound are pretty limited once you can't reach that calf. Now, in other cases, you can reach these calves all the way through gestation. So there shouldn't be a number of days here. Um, this was just kind of a, a ballpark at which point in time majority of these are going to drop over the pelvic rim. Okay, another thing with ultrasound is we can, we can pick up twin pregnancies. Um, in both of these cases here, we've got one pregnancy uh, here and another one here. Again, another case of twin pregnancies down here. Now, just because you use ultrasound, are you going to see all of the twins in the herd? 
the answer is, well, it depends. In order to see twins, you've got to be about the right stage of gestation. The easiest time to see twins is between about 40 and 60 days of gestation. Before that, they're kind of small. After that, it gets to be a little bit big. So, do you know when the cow was bred? A lot of times we don't. You know, the bull got out there and we're just kind of there. Um, that's one question. The other question is, are you making a concerted effort to look for twins? And there's some cases where you may want to do that. But finding twins inside a cow takes time with ultrasound. Yes, you can see them, but you almost have to be looking for them. One of the things that I do when I go in and preg check cows is I will physically look at the ovaries of each cow and I will count the number of CL or corpus luteum on those cows. Uh, it, uh, corpus luteum develops after a follicle is ovulated, follicle um, held the little oocyte. Okay, so if I find multiple CL on an ovary of a cow, um, that's when I go in and I look for two babies. And I do this because about 97% of all twins born come from two separate ovulations as opposed to being identical twins which result from a single ovulation. All right, the next thing I'm going to talk about is fetal sexing. And I've got a couple of fetuses here. Um, just to point out here, this is an umbilical cord. Uh, right here, I've got a penis of this calf. And here's testicles. If I look at the calf on the right, here's my umbilicus. There's nothing there. But right underneath the tail, this is the vulva of that calf. So this is a little heifer. This is a little boy, a little bull, sorry. Uh, and this is what I'm looking for. Uh, this structure is called a genital tubercle when, when a calf is young like this. Uh, and interesting point is that this thing starts at the exact same location, regardless of whether something is a bull or a heifer. So if you do a fetal sexing too early, you won't be able to tell whether it's a bull or a heifer. Now the point in time where this happens is right around 45 days is when you can physically tell by looking at a calf that, yeah, this thing is moving up here, so it's a heifer, or no, it's down here, so it's a bull. Uh, on ultrasound, this is what this looks like. And I've got kind of a key down on the bottom here of what in the heck you're looking at. But basically, this is a male fetus. We've got four legs that stick out. Umbilical cord comes in looking as a, a slightly gray structure. Right behind that, this bright white spot, that is our penis. Back up a little bit more, we've got one white fleck here, one white fleck here. These are testicles. We come to the right, what we've got here is, these are the hind legs of a calf. And so we're basically looking at the rear end of this calf. This body is away from us. So here's our hind leg, this bright white spot, right here. That is our genital tubercle, uh, which in this case is the vulva of a female fetus. Disadvantage of ultrasound right off the bat, it is by far the most expensive method. Uh, you can get some payback on it, uh, again, depending on what your goals are, and we'll get into that later, uh, because you can check earlier. Now, um, for practicality standpoint, you know, 25 to 30 days is pretty possible. And you can go, you know, 26 days in a heifer, I'm confident that we can move right along. In a cow, that number is about 28 days. Other things you can get from ultrasound if you need it or want it, uh, you can determine whether there's a, a viable fetus in there. Okay, this is one thing that the other methods don't necessarily do, uh, unless it's palpation per rectum and, and you're grabbing a calf and you feel it kick you. I mean, that happens too. You know that calf is alive then. Uh, but with ultrasound, it's a pretty non-invasive way to determine whether you've got a beating heart. Okay, it's very, very accurate. Um, early in gestation, you can get a very accurate age. You can also figure out the sex if you're at the right stage of pregnancy. Other limiting factors, you've got cost um, by far and away, and, and then maybe a bigger component, depending on where you're at, is the availability of expertise, um, technicians, veterinarians, to actually go out and do this ultrasounding for you. Uh, the other thing that I just kind of put in here, um, you know, with these early preg checks, 
the thing that people need to remember is you're always going to have a certain amount of normal loss. Okay, normally between around day 30 and day 65 of pregnancy in beef cattle, you're going to have between a two to four percent loss of pregnancy. Now that's not because you worked with palpation per rectum or that you worked with ultrasound. It's just that was going to happen anyway. So we've got to point that out. Normal biology, uh, and sometimes people will misinterpret that and say, well, your ultrasound caused my pregnancy loss. And um, we've looked at these numbers a lot, and regardless of whether you check them or not, uh, the pregnancy rates after a certain point are about the same. All right, the last one I'm going to talk about here is, is pregnancy-specific protein. So these are proteins that are released from the placenta of a calf. We don't have a placenta of a calf unless we've got a calf. So that's why they're pregnancy specific. Commercial tests say these can be detected in the blood around 28 days of gestation. Uh, but the other caution you've got to have here is that when you're checking a cow, if she's not more than 90 days postpartum, then you could be getting proteins in her blood from her previous calf. Okay, that's a danger. So um, what that means is that that cow had to be about 60 days after calving when she was bred in order for this test to mean anything. If she was only 45 days and then she got bred and you're trying to catch her really early, around 28 days, uh, you'll get a false positive reading on that test. Or you could get a false positive reading on that test. I've got this picture up here to show you that, you know what, it's really not that difficult to go out and collect blood. Um, on the right, this is my graduate student, Phil Steichen. Um, I've had him bleeding cow cows all over the place. Uh, but on the left, this is Ben Klinkner. He's a, another student at NDSU, and he's a pig guy. So I took a pig guy out there, and we were able to get him within a few minutes to be pretty handy at collecting blood from the juggler vein in cattle. Uh, whether you collect it from the juggler vein, which is going to give you a nice big target to hit, or from the tail vein working back behind the cow, uh, both of them are accurate. The issue is going to be it's going to be easier to collect blood from the head, and, um, but then you need a halter, you need to catch them. The technique of collecting blood from the tail takes a little bit longer to figure out, but it's still very, very possible. Okay, the thing about pregnancy-specific proteins is you've absolutely got to have good records. And I say this because you need to go and you need to take a blood sample. You need to record the ID tag of that cow on the blood tube. And then you need to send that information into a lab. The lab's going to analyze the results and send back um, a, something that says whether this cow is pregnant or open. So if you don't have good ID systems at your house, this is not a good option for you. Um, if there's questions, if you've got duplicate IDs, anything like this, uh, and the danger of not having this stuff in line is that you come back and you sell the wrong cow because you said, well, the test came back and said she's open. You're not exactly sure if you don't have good records. So samples, again, you send these blood tubes in. Samples are returned within a few days. The downfall, if you're going to go out and you're going to then sort off the open cows, is now you've got to gather your cows up again once you get the results, and you've got to work them again. So you've got to work cattle twice in order to cull out your animals. On the bright side, or the downside, depending on which seat you're in, uh, no veterinarian is required for this test. Some veterinarians are actually promoting and using this test with their clients but nothing is required. You can take the blood samples on your own, send them into a lab. So when I think, when I step back and look at all these different options, um, what do you want to consider? The first one is, is how are you going to use the data? Okay, uh, I'm a big proponent of doing things for a reason. So if you're not going to cull out your cows that are um, not pregnant or you're not going to do anything with it, don't even bother with any of the methods, okay? Uh, the next question I say is, well, how accurate do you need to be? Is there a reason why you want to age a fetus 
Is there a reason why you want to uh, want that kind of information? What time of the year will you check? Okay, and this is in reference to having cows that are bred, say, you know, May through June. Uh, if you're not going to preg check those cows until into November, um, some of the methods of preg checking, namely ultrasound, and maybe a more limited information to you at that point. Um, you know, the converse of that is how early in gestation do you want to check? If you want to check these cows at, um, you know, 25 to 28 days, you know, the, the pregnancy-specific protein or the um, ultrasound are pretty much your, your only options. And then the, the final question here, do you want additional information? So do, I, do you want to know the sex of these fetuses? Um, that kind of thing. That's your last consideration. So last thing I'm going to point out on this particular slide is that there is not a single method of pregnancy determination that can tell you if a bull that's in with your cows at the time of preg check, did he breed that cow yesterday or did he breed that cow three weeks ago? She could very well be pregnant, but if you don't pull him off and get him out of your cow herd, uh, you're not going to be able to tell whether or not you've got a pregnancy there. All right, so other things that you want to consider. All right, why do you want to preg check? Do you want to reduce feed requirements for some reason? Okay, if we come into a drought situation and you've got limited feed resources, then you can go ahead and identify those open cows, get them out of your herd. Do you want to reduce overall cost? You know, every day we feed a cow, we've got an additional cost on that animal. So, so the rationale for some people is to only feed those cows that are indeed pregnant and are going to give you some financial return in the form of a live calf the following year. Do you want to sort cattle into groups for some reasons? If you're running um, kind of a stalker op option, operation with bulls, there's some real financial incentives to kind of do an early preg check on these animals. And you have a group of pregnant heifers, but if you do this early enough, say you, you go out there and you're preg checking these girls in August, you're going to be able to get these, preg or these open heifers into yearling feeder calf markets. Okay, that's going to be a whole different financial situation than waiting until December to find out that these heifers are open because then they won't uh, fall into that category of um, yearling cattle for feedlot use. Okay, um, the other way people may want to do this is they want to directly sell their open cows into cull markets or they want to take those open cows off, put more weight on them. Another way to sort these cows is to use your information about age of the fetus and make some concentrated calving groups. So you go out and you know that today I'm going to concentrate on this pen of cows that's up close to home and the others, they're going to be, um, I'm still going to go out and look at them, but they shouldn't calve for a little while longer. And then you can also identify potential issues. So do you have some fertility problems out there? You've got herd nutrition, bull problems, something like that. If you do an early preg check, you can identify those problems and you can do something about it. Uh, the other thing that you can identify is twins. Uh, but back up to the fertility problems, you know, preg checking isn't your only option here. Uh, and this is where I'm a big proponent of getting out there and looking at those cattle, seeing what's going on in your herd. Because if your bulls are out there and they're busy, they're actively breeding really late in the breeding season, Maybe you've got something else going on here, or if you see a lot of open cows, a lot of riding activity when most of them should be pregnant, um, go ahead and try to do something about that while you can still salvage the breeding season. You may have some late calving cows, but at least you've got cows that are calving. All right, so the last slide I've got here, I put all of these methods uh, into one graph and said, all right, well, what's important? If I want to compare side by side, and, and I made this graph for you guys to look at your individual operations when you're uh, deciding which method you may want to use. So the first line is detection limit. You know, this is basically age at which you can do these things. And I've got them circled up here, ultrasound and pregnancy-specific protein. Uh, if age is your thing, you need to get these cattle preg checked early then one of these options is best for you. Okay, now the accurate fetal aging, this is going in and identifying how old this baby is. 
You can't do that with pregnancy-specific protein. You can do that with palpation at certain stages, and you can do that with ultrasound at certain stages. Early on in pregnancy, ultrasound is going to give you the most accurate fetal age. Later on in pregnancy, palpation is going to get a better age simply because you're feeling for different things with rectal palpation than you are with ultrasound. Identification with twins and determining the viability of a fetus, ultrasound is a way to go. If these things are important to you, uh, then consider that. Next line I've got in here is veterinarian required. I mean, we're in a state, and actually the whole nation, has got a shortage of large animal veterinarians. So if we've only got a few veterinarians out there, they can't cover everybody's cows all the time. So if you don't have a veterinarian or nobody to do it, pregnancy-specific protein may be your answer. Speaking of answers, do you need an answer right now? So if you go out and you want to sort off your cull cows today, palpation or ultrasound are the way to go. You can't do it with pregnancy-specific protein. Um, experience. And here I'm talking about how long has your person palpating your cows been palpating cows? Um, you know, a story about a year and a half ago, um, I had a call that said, you know, we have this issue and according to the ultrasound, all these cattle should be calving around a time that's much later than, than anticipated. And and it was simply an issue of experience. The operator didn't know what they were doing. Okay, You don't have that issue with pregnancy-specific protein. Now, your veterinarians that are out there in your communities, they've been doing this a long time. They're pretty darn accurate. All right. And then price, the final issue, if you're only concerned about price, uh, either the palpation or the pregnancy-specific protein would be the way to go. And actually, there, there's times when this pregnancy-specific protein is cheaper than palpation. But again, that's, that's kind of on an individual basis and in a relationship you have with your veterinarians.